Hi everyone and welcome back. We are in the second chapter of the Yoga Sutras of Patanjali and we left off at verse 15 last time of the second chapter, so 2.15, which is essentially saying everything, everything is suffering. It's it's a bit like the the first of the four noble truths in Buddhism. Everything can lead to suffering. And that is everything that is in this world. Um, that is Prakriti. Prakriti is the term that um, they use in the Yoga Sutras to refer to the natural world, nature, um, things that change because things in nature do change. They evolve. Nothing is remaining the same. And that includes us we're part of nature it includes our thoughts too our thoughts are included in that so when you're attached to the impermanence of things it's going to lead to suffering and so we talked about attachment so you being attached to this world and all the worldly things that go into it, even if you are able to create your world and surround yourself with all the things you love, create a really nice life for yourself, um, eventually that will lead to suffering. There's the there's the suffering of loss that's going to happen. And we talked about in the last chapter, you know, this, um, this surrendering, this letting go, uh, not getting too attached, not being too grippy on things because everything in this world is impermanence. So um, in reading in one of the books that I have, of course, you all know there are several versions, several translations of um, with the commentary of the Yoga Sutras of Patanjali. So right now I'm just reading my highlights from Swami Vivekananda's book. And it says, the man of good sense sees through pleasure and pain and knows that they are always equally distributed. They melt into one another. He sees that men in fulfilling their desires can never succeed. There was never a love in this world which did not know decay. We see people dying around us and we think we'll never die. Yeah, it's, it's so interesting how even though we intellectually know that we will, it's it's something that's really hard for our mind to wrap around. And even though we're all going to approach this ultimate transition from this life into whatever the next experience is going to be, even though we know this to be true intellectually, it's, it's really hard for us to accept that. He goes on, the cause of misery is the clash between the different forces of nature, rendering permanent happiness impossible. And then they talk about the gunas, where they're going to come up again. I'll just bring them up here. So they're basically describing the energy of this world that you will see. There's the tamasic energy, which is inert, still. And think of that as a stone, just sitting there, a rock. And that kind of describes this force of attraction. You get so attracted, it's stuck together. It's not moving apart. And um, you can think of that, you can think of some people you know who might be more tamasic. You can think of that stone as an example. You can think of those times when you're just feeling like you can't even make a decision, you don't know what to do, you're just immobile. And then rajasic is another type of energy, which um, think of water. It's really hard to contain water. It's just going to constantly move and you might put a blockage here. It's going to move around. Think of, you know, aversion and running away from something 
Um, you can think of people you know who are very rajasic. They can't sit still. They have a very hard time, say, in Shavasana. That might be the hardest pose for them of all. Um, they're attracted to that kind of yoga, like a power flow or some kind of a vinyasa that where you're constantly moving in that stillness is going to be difficult for them. And then there's sattva. And that energy, think of the sun and illuminating this wonderful light. And I used to think of it as, you know, tamasic on one side, rajasic on the other, and then sattva is just being a balance of the two. But now I think of it as more of a pyramid. It's like they are different. And it's instead of being a balance, it's like a, it's something to achieve. It's something even higher. And it's different than both. And think of the illumination of the sun. And, you know, many saints were depicted in oil paintings as having a halo. And I like to believe those are the sattvic people. And that's where we want to go. And sattvic people understand the impermanence of this world. And then the very next verse says pain that has not come is avoidable, which kind of contradicts what we just said, like mm, everything leads to suffering, but the pain that has not come, and then, you know, karma is introduced as well. And so, and karma comes from our experiences and, you know, in this culture where this these teachings came from, they believe in reincarnation. But even if that doesn't resonate with you, you know, in the Judeo-Christian belief system, like your what what you have, how you act now will have an effect on your future afterlife, right? So thinking about how to avoid future pains, you can avoid future negative karma, karmic experience. You can, you can avoid contributing to your negative karma. Um, I guess we have to go back and talk about samskaras. Samskaras are impressions and all of the experiences you have had in your life have left an impression. And you can think of cultural differences, um, different impressions. And those affect how you experience a thing. And they also affect how you react to something. And you may hear people today's day talking about triggers. Well, those triggers basically are, you know, there's a past experience that you've had that is contributing to this reaction you're going to have now. And so... We're going to talk about that a little bit more about these, these obstacles that we have towards our lasting happiness. So what we're looking for is not to just feed our senses in this experience that we're having in this life, but we're looking for a, a very lasting kind of something that transcends our experience in this life's lasting happiness, a lasting peace. Um, so let's keep going and dive a little deeper. There's some confusion about what is actually going to bring us happiness. And so we talked about Prakriti. But what's what what else is there? What's on the other side? That's Purusha. That is your soul. That is that thing that would illuminate with sattvic energy if we can just clear away all the other stuff. Um, that's what we're looking for. We're looking for that sattvic self. And um and so verse 2.17 basically says there we get we get confused a lot. And when we get confused, that is what's leading to our suffering. So in Iyengar's book, 
he would describe it as this, unknown future pains can be prevented by adhering now to yogic principles. Patanjali is saying that yoga is a preventative healing art, science, and philosophy by which we build up a robust health, health in body and mind and construct a defensive strength with which to deflect or counteract afflictions that are as yet unperceived afflictions. Strong health and a stable mind will enable us to face the wonder of wonders, that spiritual bliss, that thing that is lasting, not the impermanence that exists in Prakriti. The cause of pain is this confusion of mixing up the two, the Prakriti, the things of this world that are impermanent, that are going to just bring us temporary joy, even if they bring us, you know, some are going to bring us joy, some are going to bring us pain, but even the ones that we think are bringing us joy, it's all very temporary. Um, and confusing that with what is really lasting bliss. And he talks about the ego, the seed of the ego is, oh, I thought this was interesting. So he actually talks, yeah, Iyengar talks about like places of the brain that can be identified with, say, the seat of the ego is the seat of the brain and the, and the seat of the great self with a capital S is the spiritual heart. True meditation, in true meditation, yoga dissolves, allowing the great self, Harusha, to shine sattvically in its own glory. So again, the soul, our soul is separate from this body and nature. Nature is one thing, the soul is another thing. Verse 21 does say though that the nature it does have a resemblance to things that are brilliant and sattvic and, and bright and light. And that is like, you know, examples of this just planted all around Prakriti, examples of that sattvic, that bliss, Purusha, um, Samadhi is exists in this experience of this world. Um, and we'll see it and maybe we'll get glimpses of it and remember it. And it will help us to attach to that. But we have to be very yogic. And we'll talk about these practices in this chapter. Um, and I may have mentioned it last time, but I'll say it here again. So it's as though, just imagine we like make this choice to come down to have this experience in this body, this time around, we're using this body and whatever circumstances we were born into, and this earth for our spiritual growth. And it's all gonna be temporary. We're here temporary. So if you've got things going on in your life that are just awful, it's a temporary experience. And also don't forget, if you've got things that are going on that are amazing, that's also a temporary experience, right? So as you go in the up and down roller coaster of life, you know, if you, if you understand that concept, maybe it won't feel like such a wild ride. So the cause of our pain or pleasure is always a joining of ourself with this body as we experience the world with our senses. And if we're perfectly certain that we're not this body. We shouldn't take notice of things like comfort and discomfort, or this is too hot, or this is too that, or this is too cold, and, and basically become more easygoing to the experiences that are happening around us. The whole universe is one ocean of matter. You are, you are just a tiny particle of it. And so is that person over there. And so is the rock and the water and the sun. We're just particles, just hanging around in this experience of this lifetime, our brief time on this earth. 
And there's a story that I'm thinking of right now from Thich Nhat Hanh. And he says, the other day, I was in a park and I was having a conversation with a leaf. This leaf taught me a lot this leaf dangling on the branch, just barely holding on. I asked it some questions and it told me lots of things. In fact, it told me it was the mother to the tree. Whereas you might think otherwise, but yes, through the sunlight, it nourished the tree, gave nourishment to the tree. And I asked the leaf if it was afraid because there were many other leaves that had fallen to the ground and it looked like this leaf was about to fall to the ground. And the leaf told me, no, all of the spring and summer, I danced, I, I, I was very much alive. And now I know that I'm about to fall to the ground and I'm going to dance joyfully to the ground. And it is there where I will become part of the soil and continue to nourish the tree. And if we could only look at our existence in this life like that, I mean, just how awesome would that be? But no, as we talked about with the, the clashes, there is definitely this, this fear of our own death that's just innate with all of us, everyone, even the wisest, of the sages, um, as we cling to this life, we cling to this life and all of the souls, all of the cells in our body want us to continue to sustain. It's just like the flower that opens up towards the sunlight and the trees that are kind of racing towards the sunlight. There's definitely this yearning for that, for life. So we are trying to train our mind to really understand that there is something more to understand, to be, to cultivate discrimination, to cultivate that understanding, to see this experience in this world for what it is um, and to not, again, get yanked up and down on that roller coaster ride. Um, yeah, it's just so easy to turn towards the worldly pleasures and get a little bit confused with and wrapped up in those and not see that bigger picture. And so Patanjali offers us this recipe essentially um, with what we can do to help train our mind. And it isn't going to be um, just one thing. It isn't going to be easy. And so um, in the second chapter, verse 29, he describes the eight limbs of yoga. The eight limbs of yoga don't involve <laughs> very, there are some experiences that you will have in yoga class that are from the eight limbs of yoga, but let's just understand and realize that there's a lot more to it than that, than triangle pose or asana, the physical practice of yoga, downward facing dog and, and these wonderful poses that may feel great in your body or just feel good after you do them. That's in there. That's one of the eight limbs. But if you've ever heard a teacher say in a class, you know, at the end of class, like, okay, now go out there and enjoy the rest of your day and, and bring, bring, yoga off the mat and you might think what is she talking about or what is he talking about and you might have heard them say there's more to yoga than just the poses what does that mean is it just being a nice person out there in the world well this is what it is the first two of the eight limbs of yoga are things that happen just every day everywhere the first one is the yamas and actually, before I say what the yamas are, just imagine it goes from out to in. And by out to in, it's like the first one is how you interact with others in society, how you interact out there in the world. They're like moral codes of conduct. They're the restraints. They're like, I think of, um, you know, to uh, draw a parallel from my 
you know, Catholic upbringing. They're like the Ten Commandments. Um, so let me, I definitely know what they all are, but let me find the, let me just look down here, make sure I'm remembering them all and in order. So the first one is do not harm. I'm saying do not, because as I was saying, the Ten Commandments are just kind of, it's got the parallel and their restraints. So their nonviolence is a term you'll usually use, but do not harm. And um, I think in the Ten Commandments, it's do thou shall not kill. I think that's how they say it, but it's more than that. Um, when you say do not harm, I mean, there's many harmful things that you can do to another person. And even though I imagine I'm not talking to people who are physically violent, although there are those people out there, I am sure, but, you know, harm with your words, um, maybe being harmful to somebody's reputation, talking about other people, hurting people in many ways. And then when we think of these, it's also good to kind of flip the flip the lens and also think of not harming yourself too with that and the harmful words that you may even silently, just silently say to yourself. Or even when I think of the physical practice of yoga as a microcosm of what we're what we're doing out there in the world, just trying not to have negative self-talk in any way to yourself, but on the mat, trying to compare yourself to others, trying to put your body into poses that maybe, maybe, you know, you have you, logically, you know, you have this old injury that acts up and you should, you know, maybe at the beginning of the class, you kind of think, uh, yeah, I don't want to overdo it and do too much, but then you find yourself in class kind of pushing it for whatever reason probably the ego talking there and again detaching from that in is what we're talking about so nonviolence, and then truthfulness thou shall not lie is one of the commandments so truthfulness um and again it's being honest in flipping that lens being honest with yourself too um I think I often say the ego is always lying to us. So be careful with that. I think forgiveness is a big, big practice with that. Next, we have not stealing. And I imagine that many of you think, well, I got that one nailed. I'm not someone who takes things from other people, but Think of it the small ways why you might where you might take more than you need, or um, even you know grabbing the I don't know the shampoo bottles from the hotel, or sometimes I think of like Mother Earth and like just in ways that we're taking from the resources of the earth. Another thing to think about is even if you are not, say, someone who is a thief per se, but where is your money invested? Um, and I know that I have my money in mutual funds and I started to feel like, what, where is it invested in what funds and what industries? Is it like fossil fuels? Is it... I'm not paying attention to it because I just don't have the the fortitude to do that. But I I want to make sure that that my footprint on the earth is isn't taking more of the resources of this planet than as minimally as I can. I think about us as a whole nation here in the United States anyway, and how as a nation we are probably we are using more of the world's resources than others. So just trying to be next level of wherever I am and baby steps to try to be better in that. And the next one is, and by the way, I didn't really say the Sanskrit names for it, but so ahimsa is nonviolence, satya 
is truthfulness, anasteya is not stealing, and brahmacharya is, well, I'm looking at the definitions here, and um, I guess this is Iyengar chastity I highlighted, but it's often been practiced as celibacy, and in a lot of re various religions, there is a, um, a vow of celibacy that is taken, um, but it is also in even the yogic circles and other yoga text, um, it's been described as it's okay if you're a married person to be having sex with your spouse, but sex out sex outside of your spouse, that would not be okay. Um, and many of the texts too talk about just kind of conserving that sexual energy and not just flinging it out all over the place. Like literally in Ayurveda, there's a substance ojas or something and it contains your life force and it exists in your I guess once say the word semen um, I'm not an expert in this but you know so conserving that is supposed to have some health benefits but I also just think of like what you're doing to yourself if you're like looking at porn or you're just leaning in towards any kind of any kind of addiction is bad but just kind of needing to feed that desire too much and how it's going to affect you mentally and physically and spiritually um so being aware of that a parigraha actually i think it's pronounced Aparigraha, I've heard it both ways, but that is not being greedy, not taking more of your share. And again, when I think about like mm, how we in this country live, I mean, it, just knowing how much food is wasted, how much the, everything that you go to, I even try to buy organic, but it's often wrapped in plastic. And I just think of just the, the resources that we're using um, more than your share. How many people do you know? And I am guilty of this where I have a condo, a second, you know, second vacation place. And so trying to Trying to live more minimal, minimalistic is a goal here. And you can imagine that, I mean, I say you can imagine because I haven't been to India, but I do know the traditional, you know, practicing yogis, they give up their possessions. Well, think of Gandhi, that movie I watched some years ago, that is a really old movie, but I watched it again. Um, you know, he, he wasn't born in India, but when he went to India and he really wanted to practice this, practice these yamas. So he did give up possessions um, and he was not wearing the suits. He was an attorney. He wasn't wearing suits anymore. He was wearing a loincloth. He wasn't sitting in chairs. So um, these are people who are really practicing this deeply, um, and the niyamas too, which we'll get to next. So, you know, you can you can know what these are and lean into them more and think of wherever you are um, being a little bit better. And that's going to build, again, that spiritual karma. It's just little by little if you need to. And it does say in these, well, there is a belief again, that there is a thing of reincarnation. So wherever you are spiritually in this life, you get to continue on this journey in the next. So then the niyamas, the niyam, as the yamas are how you interact with others and it's the restraints and the do nots, the, the niyamas are the do's. Let's do some things as well. Let's build some healthy habits. That's why I'd like to think of them as healthy habits. Um, 
And so the first one being Saucha, being cleanliness. And of course there's cleanliness like taking care of this body and making sure it's clean, which is going to be good for your physical health. And why do we want to live a long time anyway? Because we want to project as or progress as much as we can spiritually in this life. So cleanliness is going to be healthy for you. It's also not offensive to other people. Um, but I also think of how, you know, what we're trying to do here is have a peaceful state of mind. I think of how when I walk into my house, if it's a mess and I just want to hang out, I might need to straighten up the space. Um, I know that when I go, it's nice to go on vacation and you you stay at a place that is sort of not cluttered. Um, there's some kind of sense of calm versus oftentimes if I go somewhere and it's just a very cluttered space, I'm like, <sighs> even in my own house, I kind of try to try to declutter as much as possible, but sometimes it's just so hard. We accumulate again, a parigraha, we accumulate more than we need. At least I feel like that happens to me. I shouldn't speak for everybody, but accumulating more than we need in this, in this culture, culturally how we live, like, you know, every commercial is trying to convince us to buy more stuff every holiday we have. I was even talking to someone recently about St. Patrick's Day and how uh, that is now a holiday where, you know, um, the kids get chocolates and gifts and <laughs> I guess the leprechaun leaves stuff around. And I remember when my kids were young and I there was a full moon fairy thing. It's like, wait, what? Now once a month we have to put... <laughs> I don't know, put little rain boots outside and fill them up because the full moon fairy came. It's like, we just tend to turn every holiday into some other way to buy more stuff and spend more money. Okay, that's a little bit of a tangent. So um, how did I get on that? Anyway, cleanliness Think of also what you put into your brain, like, you know, the news, having it on incessantly. Yes, it's good to know what's going on, to be active, but just it can be really kind of hard on the nervous system too. But also what kind of television shows or movies are you watching? Um, or music. What kind of music are, what are the, you know, kids music these days, the lyrics are ooh, pretty shocking <laughs> compared to what I remember when I was their age. Um, what are you ingesting in general? And in fact, what kind of food are you eating? Just being aware, cleanliness and purity in, in all ways. Um, Santosha, this is my favorite. Almost everyone of my teachers and the books refer to it as contentment. But as I have tried to understand it, I think there's another um, layer and complexity to it as well. But let's just say it was, the first I heard was contentment. And I, even just that blew my mind that that's a practice because that's what we're talking about right now. Contentment being a practice, oh, you don't just sit around and wait until you are content. You don't just hope. No, it's a practice. It, you don't just try to accomplish certain things because then you'll be happy after you accomplish them or try to acquire things because then you'll be content after you have them. No, it's a practice. It's a practice of being content with what you have right now. What you have is enough. Oh, after a conversation about this, um, somebody sent me something about Jim Carrey saying, you know, somebody was asking, what's your next project? It's like, you know what? I don't, I don't have to have another project. I've done enough. I have enough. I am enough. And I thought what a beautiful mantra that is. So enoughness, 
I think that's a really important part of understanding of this one, enoughness. What you have is enough right now, kind of lingering in the present moment and, and sitting there and actually being okay with it and just even focusing on just your breath. Um, I think this practice is so powerful. So if you aren't content and you, mm, this one's hard for you, and you can start with a practice of gratitude each morning before you even open up your eyes as you're lying in bed, just start to, just in your mind, just think of the things that you have to be grateful for. Maybe you feel like everything's going wrong in your world, but there's probably a few things you can think of to be grateful for. The sun is shining outside this window. Where I live, I can say this, I mean, it's pretty spectacular here in Northern California. Um, any friend or loved one who's supportive of you now or in your life in any way, shape or form or whatever status your health is right now, um, being grateful that it is what it is, that we live in a place where we don't have to fear bombs landing on our house, that we have shelter. Just practicing enoughness and then tapas. Tapas, it translates to, we talked about this earlier, but translates to discipline and it also literally means to heat because to heat is transformative. And when you discipline, it's like, mm, it takes some effort to be disciplined, but it is through that effort where you can really transform a thing. Like if you want to run a marathon, you don't just go and run a marathon. You have to like work up to it. And you might not want, want to get up and go jogging that morning. You might be sore. You might just, the weather might be crappy, but you have to be disciplined in order to do it. And it's also, if you're trying to restrict, let's say you, it's important to lose weight. I'm using these things that are all physical, but losing weight. So then you have to restrain and cut things out. And that takes willpower. Those things are tapas. And in Reverend Jagannath Carrera's book, I love how he talks about, he defines it as accepting pain as a means of purification. And so there are those painful experiences that you do intentionally, like whatever the practices of, of um, you know, getting up and going on that jog so you can accomplish this marathon, or the practice of seated meditation, even when you don't feel like it, even when you want to sleep in instead of get up and sit and meditate. So um, those are voluntary, difficult, uncomfortable situations that you're putting yourself in, in the hopes that you can transform. And, but there's also... What if you're just going through a painful experience in your life? Something horrible has happened to you. There is this acceptance of this pain that you're going through as a means of purifying, literally burning karma. So you can think of it that way. Um, I remember in my Catholic upbringing, some kind of teaching like this too. Tapas. And then Svadhyaya. And that is what we're doing right now, spiritual study. It's um, studying sacred texts, inspiring texts, studying inspiring um, individuals, and having books on your nightstand that, um, you know, could be Walt Whitman. It could be the Yoga Sutras. It could be the Bhagavad Gita. It could be um, a friend of mine, she reads the Bible. I think it's, it's called the way or something, the word or something like that. You know, just leaning into that, which is inspiring and helps you on your spiritual path. Um, it, I think they, they also talk about here, a mantra, having a mantra practice. So you take a statement and it could be in your own language 
that is inspiring and powerful. Like we just said, I am enough. I have enough. I, I've done enough. You know, that could be your mantra um, in your language. Understand what it means. Repeat it over and over to go deeper. Going deep inside to, again, what we're trying to accomplish. Do you remember way back at the beginning of this text? The beginning of this text was, we're trying to quiet the mind. Why would we want to do that? So our true self could be revealed. And so going deep inside and trying to understand what is our true self? What is that? What are we trying to find? What are, where is our light within that isn't really attached to this temporary status of this body, this bag of bones that we're walking around, you know, trying to understand what our true light within is. So that's Svadhyaya. And then Ishvara Pranadana. And Ishvara is the term that's used for God in this text. Um, and it, it literally, it's hard to translate. All these words are written in Sanskrit in a different culture a long time ago. So I might use the term God, but it just means a higher power of some sort. Um, because in this philosophy, there is a belief that there is a higher power of some sort. But again, I'm using the term God because it's the most common in our culture, but it could be Shiva, it could be Brahma, it could be Vishnu, it could be Allah, it could be, you know, I mean, the difference is with Buddhism is it is a non-dual, I'm not in the Buddhist lane, but it's non-dualistic right? And so there is this dualism here. And the dualism is that there is this other, this other than this, um, this Prakriti experience, right? Um, and so, but I love just if, if you don't believe in a God, that's okay. My teacher, who, when I was studying with her, I have quite a few people, people that I've studied with that I respect and I would call my teachers. But when I said to her, I asked this question, is the yoga sutras non-dualistic or dualistic? This was one after, you know, I just didn't know. And she was like, she didn't want to answer. And she said something like, mm, I think of it as I'd like to believe. She said, she said, wow, you're just really coming out. We've the, this is a big question. I'm in a room with 60 people. And she's like, I'd like to believe it's non-dualistic. So then I took that and I I was talking with another teacher and she kind of looked at me. She's like, it's dualistic, of course. What are you talking about? This whole Prakriti and Purusha, it's dualistic. This term Ishvada, it's in there. There's no way around it now. After studying it more, there's no way around it. That's what these teachings are. And I'm not trying to convert anybody. I'm just saying it exists in this text. But I love the Pranadana. Pranadana is really like surrender. And so Ishvara Pranadana means surrender to God. But even if that isn't a practice for you, surrender still has to be an important practice in this life. Surrender and letting go. Letting go may be a term that resonates better for some people. I have someone who comes on and he's like, mm, I don't like that word surrender. It's like this person has studied martial arts a lot. It's like laying down the sword and giving up. And um, and I could argue that, yeah, well, maybe that's what it means. It's giving up this attachment that we have so much to our own prakriti and our own existence, trying to make this existence permanent because it's never going to be so maybe it is laying down the sword of that but if you don't like the term surrender just think of the practice of letting go think of a nurturing hug from your mom where you you know you're just so sad you're so sad but she just holds you pulls him in, pulls you into her bosoms and you can just soften and let go I say it often in my yoga classes. Once I get people in Shavasana, just really relax and let go. Don't try to do your to-do list right now. Just let go. Any tension you're holding in your face, let go of that even more. 
And as you just completely let go, surrender, allow yourself to be held up by the supportive floor. Doesn't that feel good to just let go in this life? We're constantly trying and climbing and gripping and, oh, and it's hard. Life can be hard. And just to stay ahead, it's like we're treading water. Honestly, just to let go and relax is such a beautiful practice to be able to do it because physically it literally allows you to slip from your sympathetic nervous that flight or flight fight or flight state into parasympathetic nervous system which is so healthy and so important for your physical body and for your mental health yeah so i think we'll stop there and uh, continue on next week. See you. Thank you for listening.